Hello and welcome to episode four of the Physique Development Podcast. This show is a question and answer based show where we take questions we've been asked by our listeners and answer them through our industry experience as coaches and from our own professional perspectives. Today we'll be dis discussing three commonly asked topics and questions. Number one, what to know before you start competing. This one's going to be led by Coach Alex. Number two, how to not get quote unquote lost in the online space. This one led by Coach Sue. And number three, how does one focus on form when starting out? This one led by myself, Coach Austin. What you can expect from today's podcast is for each topic or question to be put on the clock for about 15 to 20 minutes. The coach leading the topic or question will start the discussion. This will then be followed up by the other coaches weighing in with their thoughts and experience. It's our goal not only supply you, the listener, with valuable insights on the topic or questions at hand, but also plant some seeds for further research and thought. So without further ado, let's get into topic number one, which is things to know before you start competing. So Alex, from your experience working with physique athletes, what do you need to know before you start competing? Many things. There's a lot of things to know before you get into competing that are going to be beneficial for you. Uh, and, and I think that um, the, the, the first thing with competing, and this is going to be across all divisions, and we'll speak more uh, to bikini competitors as that is going to be our main um, clients that we work with here at Physique Development, but we also work with other divisions as well. So knowing your why is is a great place to start. It's very easy to get caught up into Instagram and to see the final product of your uh, the favorite person that you follow. They have beautiful stage shots. Uh, it, it looks like so much fun. They they had uh, a great outing. They look so awesome. Their their hair, their uh, their suit, all these different things. It's very enticing on the surface, and it's very easy to say, okay, I want to do that as well. But it is very challenging. Uh, it, it's not something that's going to be easy and something that you want to half-ass at any point. And so having a true why of why you want to compete, not just because um, that that person you follow on Instagram is a competitor, or maybe it's, it's time to uh, get ready for summer. Uh, competing is certainly not a way to get ready for bikini season by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and so, so truly having that why of why you want to compete, whether that be that you love bodybuilding or that you uh, want a, a challenge, you are craving the competitive nature of competing. Uh, maybe you're a previous athlete and you want to have that same experience again uh, is a, a great why. But identifying your why and, and uh, going from there and being able to always come back to that during the harder times of competing is going to be very beneficial for you. Time. Time is a, a big component for you to, to understand, not only giving yourself enough time to, to prep, because maybe you have seen on uh, Instagram or maybe at your local gym that 12 weeks is kind of a, a rule of thumb or a, enough time to get ready. When you think of it, you know, three months, that sounds like a long time, but in the reality of things, you may not be in a position to lose uh, all the body fat that you need to in that short period of time. Three months is really not... Uh, a whole lot of time in the grand scheme of things. So giving yourself a, a plethora of time, uh, general rule of thumb for us is thinking that understanding how much fat you need to lose and then uh, using that per week. So if you have 20 pounds to lose, we would recommend that you would do 20 weeks of contest prep. Slow and steady is going to bring a much better look to the stage. If you try to rush and maybe you do the 12 week prep and you end up losing 25 pounds in that time frame. One, the look is not going to be very good. And two, it's going to be hell for you. Yeah, it's going to be very hard post uh, diet and the dieting phase itself is going to uh, not be all that fun. And then also looking at your own schedule. What do you have coming up? It's going to be hard in your first contest prep to diet through a, a wedding or a vacation or different components like that. So look at what is on the forecast for you and ensure that you're not running into these very challenging moments uh, in your first contest prep as much as you can avoid it. Um, and then, and then commitment financially as well as, um, personally. So financially it's going to be a, 
a big thing for you. We uh, supply all of our future competitors with a list of things to uh, save for. Uh, generally, we're going to recommend that all clients are that have or are wanting to compete have a savings of two to four thousand dollars just to cover all the main things. There's there's many things that are going to come up: the tan, the the jewelry, your hair, um, paying for the coach. I mean, there's there's so many different components that you have to be cognizant of and not. Once you get later into that prep and getting to a point where potentially you're very high stress because of cardio, low food, all those different things, adding more financial stress on top of that, something that you could have avoided potentially by saving and whatnot, um, would, would be, you know, something that we'd want to do. So the financial commitment is, is a big component of things. And then just the commitment for you, uh, you, you are, are putting in all this time, all this effort. It is going to be a lot on your plate over that time frame. Uh, to to half-ass this approach and, you know, kind of be in, kind of be out and not very certain of, of your why or anything like that is going to make your experience not great. And, you know, a, a sport that has done so much for the three of us on, on this podcast, it would, it, it, it breaks my heart personally to, to have people have poor experiences with it where, um, you know, I've had such a good experience. So, uh, really being invested, really being committed to whatever the time frame is in the show that you are doing, having a, a support system, uh, speaking with your family, speaking with your spouse, letting them know what this is going to entail, uh, having a general idea of, Hey, this is how long things are going to be. I'm going to be very strict with my meals. I'm not going to be able to, to go out as, as frequently. Um, and just letting them know that maybe I'm lower energy, being very vocal with them beforehand, setting expectations properly is going to be very important. Um, once those things are in alignment, then hiring a quality coach, uh, a quality coach that's going to help guide you, help with the expectations of things and, and putting you in the best position possible, as well as looking out for your overall health from start to finish. And then uh, the last thing that you really want to focus on before you get into your first competition is having a plan post show. Too many people just think, okay, I'm going to prep for 16 weeks and then I can do you know whatever I want. The reality is, is that you lose an, a great deal of body fat. Uh, you may have some horm hormonal downregulation, some thyroid function downregulation. That all needs to be corrected, and that's going to transpire in the weeks and months following the show. And so, understanding that you are not just thinking that, that 16 weeks, you're also thinking the next, you know, eight weeks following that 16 weeks or whatever it is uh, to to better plan. Because if you go and and crush it for those 16 weeks. And then you're just like, ah, it, it's over. I can do whatever I want. You're going to find yourself in a world of hurt and, and really upset that you didn't prioritize that time as well, because the reverse diet, the post-show time frame, is just as important as the, the prep itself. Yeah, those are all phenomenal points. I, I would love for you to um, expand a little bit um, mm -hmm. on possibly just the time as far as going into a prep. I know you talked about the duration of a prep, but just kind of what to prepare. We That might even be a whole nother episode of just kind of like what you should do before you decide on a prep or what's going to set you up for the most success. But I guess Cliff Notes version of what would you say as far as time for someone who looks at competing says, oh, I want to compete as someone who's just getting into fitness. Is that a good option for them? Or what does that look like? Probably not. Um, I think that in terms of getting into the or having a time frame in total, uh, one thing that we do at physique development is a, a prep to prep getting them in a position from a body fat perspective from a, a training perspective mentality perspective, ready to get into that prep. Uh, with with clients who inquire to immediately get into a prep, we very infrequently infrequently will do that as it we don't know your body uh, we don't have a established relationship with you as a, a coach to a client and all those things are going to be of great benefit to you and ensuring that you have enough muscle tissue to truly compete and compete well uh, is going to be very important so giving yourself even more time of reaching out to the coach and having a time frame prior to getting into the prep is going to be immensely beneficial to you as the athlete uh, and your overall experience with it yeah. 
Um, I'll, I'll just touch on a few points here. Um, one thing, though, that I'll mention is when it comes to prep and when it comes to everything, this isn't just something that you just want to be like, oh, that looks kind of fun. I want to do it. Or I just want to check it off my bucket list. Um, this isn't comparable to like doing a rec league basketball team with your friends of like, oh, okay, we kind of go to practice. We kind of just stick around. We play and we have fun. If that's what you want to do, then realize you can still be fit, live a healthy lifestyle and accomplish those goals. You don't have to do a prep to define yourself as a fitness person whatsoever. And I've seen that a lot often as people thinking, well, I need to do a prep either for my business or I need to do a prep so people know that I'm serious about fitness. You definitely do not. <laughs> prep is a whole nother beast to jump into. And it can be a very, very ugly beast if you're not taking it seriously. Because like Alex talked about it, the repercussions post prep, if you don't do it the right way, or you don't take time to find a quality coach, if you try to cut corners with costs, that can really impact your health. If you're like, oh, this coach is $100 cheaper. Does that coach have your best interest in mind? Does that coach have the education? Does that coach have other competitors? being able to look at that instead of just being like, oh, well, this is a cheaper route. Because if you're going to spend 10, 12, 16, 20, 25, 30 weeks, or if you did a Corona prep, then spending months and months and months on end in prep, then you want to have someone that's on your side who knows what they're doing. If you were to go and get a surgery, you wouldn't say, oh, this one's a little bit cheaper. I'm going to go ahead and go with Joe Schmo instead of Dr. Joe Schmo, who actually knows what they're doing. So that's going to be something that I highly, highly, highly recommend not trying to cut corners when it comes to a prep, because it will come around and bite you in the butt and you will not be happy with it. Um, and then something else here is Alex did talk about a lot of the hard parts of prep, and it definitely can be hell-ish in a way, but your mindset goes big time into that. If you're constantly thinking, oh, I'm in prep, I'm in a deficit, life so so hard for me. Life is going to be hard for you and it is going to suck. And then that negative attitude is going to reflect on your physique. And it's also going to really annoy the people surrounding you. Um, so being able to work on your mindset and like Alex talked about your why being able to circle around to that and recognize what a privilege it is to extreme diet. Yes, prep is an extreme. I mean, it's something that is you can become an Olympian while prepping and while doing bodybuilding. And so taking that lightly and just being in a place where you are um, not really in the right headspace can have detrimental effects on you. Um, and then when it comes to a prep, this isn't a time that you're going to have a ton of balance, so to speak. Each person's balance is going to look different within different phases of their life. And this transitions into the last point I personally want to make um, is about just the stress that it puts on other people. You might think, well, this is my personal decision that I'm doing this, and it's not really going to affect anyone else. And I'll kind of even pass the mic over to Alex back again, just because I have recently prepped. And so it's more recent in his head as far as the stress that it put on our relationship, even though it was quote unquote, me doing everything or my work or something that shouldn't have affected someone else, it does affect other people. Yeah. And from a, a spouse perspective, it's going to be different when the the spouse also competes. So if you're looking at someone who is is completely naive to, to what the, the competing world entails, um, I, I think that, like I said, being out in front of, of things and uh, expressing to them that you're going to need potentially a little bit more help on household chores or, or different topics of the such can be beneficial. Uh, so in terms of, of stress on the relationship, I think that it will come down to, hey, date nights may be a little bit less frequent. Um, or you can look at it in a way that, hey, date nights may be a little bit different. They're not going to be maybe oriented around food or what have you. Maybe we're going on um, just more consistent walks and kind of calling that our, our date time and, and spending time at the park or different things like that. It, it, you know, we're in a in a world now that a lot of things are uh, in our culture uh, oriented around food, and so when we're in a position that um, of of contest prep or anything like that, we kind of you know, the the op the options for date night and the options for gatherings seem to uh, you know become very select. So uh, being open to being creative and and different ideas and and working on that is is extremely important. Yeah. 
Um, so like I said, that that balance is going to be extremely different for different stages of your life and in different preps throughout your life. But throughout a prep, don't try to keep this like insane amount of balance just to prove that you can because to be elite, there's not much balance. If you look at someone like I mean, LeBron James, he doesn't have much balance in his life. He is basketball because he is elite at basketball. And so if you're wanting to be elite at something, recognizing that that's going to off kilter your balance there um, and it's going to go towards something else. So still be social. I remained social all through my prep. I traveled throughout my prep. Um, I just brought my food with me and I did what I needed to do. And I got up earlier to get cardio done so I could go and be social or whatever that may be. But recognize recognize kind of what that costed, which Alex out- outlined a great deal um, just within talking about what it looks like for your upcoming life and if you actually think that you can commit to it. Yeah, great points, but I, I don't really have too much to add there. I, I think you guys nailed that. And um, as far as <clears throat> as far as anything I have to add, um, or not really add, I think just echo more or less is at least in conversations that I have uh, with folks who are Um, at least considering competing uh, or just in general uh, a transformation of any kind or or sort of any change in lifestyle. And this is a drastic one. So if you're looking to get into competing, again, this is not something that you need to prove yourself with or this is not necessarily the best approach of, I'd like to dabble in competing. Um, It's not something you really dabble in. It's something that you really commit to or you should commit to uh, because there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot financially. There's a lot uh, from a mental, emotional state and a lot physically that goes into it. Uh, and especially if you, a, if you have a coach on the other end, right? They're, that's someone who's really going to be committed as well or should be committed to the thing you're wanting to do, uh, which is compete, right? So not getting into this to dabble. Uh, I, I think um, not saying this can't be fun or, or something that you you invest in um, from a time or uh, physical or mental, emotional uh, standpoint just to see if you could do it. Um, But you need to have a lot of ducks in a row uh, like these other guys talked about. And I think the the two main points that I want to echo is there's going to be a lot of sacrifice that's going to have to be made to to go through this and do it well. Um, From a time perspective, from a mental and emotional perspective, um, from a physical perspective, and then everything else you have going on in life. I mean, everything else from partners to, to social uh, relationships to professional uh, tasks, uh, academic tasks. I, I remember I, I've done most of my competing while, or pretty much all my competing while I was in uh, university. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's things that you have to keep in mind. Um, and there's a lot that sort of fell into place for me, I know. Uh, but you know, there's, there's reasons, some reasons, uh, to why I haven't competed since, um, you know, um, different stages of your lives bring different challenges, new perspectives, uh, things like that. So, but understanding my main point here is is sacrifice and understanding it's going to take a lot of sacrifice. So what I would recommend is sit with that, um, really sit with a lot of these things that, that Sue and Alex brought up, uh, write them down, um, in, or speak about them to someone that you trust that's in your circle, uh, like your partner or a very close friend that has your best interest in mind. Um, it's not that you need to allow them to talk you out of anything that you want to do, but you need to have a conversation, I, I think, with those you trust and do have truly your best interest in mind and, and understand that um, creating a good network of people to, to surround yourself with during this time is very advantageous. And that brings me to my second point of echoing here, which is communicate. Uh, you have to communicate with those around you. You have to communicate with your partner uh, down to the little things, uh, down to the things that you know are going to come up. Um, so the last prep that I did, um, I basically went from, you know, let's say pretty much single um, through my first, I mean, kind of through my first few preps. And then my fourth prep, I was in a very, very committed you know, I think we were engaged to be married at this point, um, relationship. And those were different experiences altogether. Um, there was a lot more to juggle. It felt like there was a lot more to balance out. 
um, to what I could try and balance out from a time perspective, from a social perspective, from a, a normalcy of life perspective. Um, but in no way was it normal. In no way was it was it balanced. And that was something that I had to communicate early on. That was like before I even went into the prep, I was like, this is what to expect um, because my wife does not come from this world uh, of competing. And so it's, you know, that's something, especially if your partner or, or those in your life don't understand or don't fully comprehend what this entails, you cannot expect someone to know something that they don't know and something that they've never experienced before, right? It's like seeing a color you've never, uh, or explaining a color or experiencing a color you've never seen before. It's like, it's, it's impossible unless you, someone articulates it and, and that's your responsibility, right? So if you have things that you want to do, sacrifices you want to make, um, you need to include everyone that's in that, uh, and, and those that are sur surrounding you immediately, your immediate surroundings. So right. That really close, uh, like your best friends, um, and your partner or, or whatever. Uh, I think that's important. And communicating where things are going to change and when things are going to change. And this is, if you are a first time competitor, where a coach can come in clutch and a good coach, right? So one with an experience or one with experience with other competitors, uh, whether female, male, whatever. Um, very, very important because there are going to be things that happen, you know, Sue's uh, film videos over changes in, in sex drive, for example, though you can find those on our YouTube. Um, and that, that's just one aspect of, but such a large aspect of a relationship that's so, so important to address early on is that, look, there are things that's going to change. Date nights are going to change as, as these guys mentioned. Um, sex drive is going to change. Hormonal, uh, levels are going to change. And there's these things that happen, right? That we have to communicate with our partners and are those that are close around us. And more or less, we're looking to get people kind of alongside the journey with us um, in the best way that we can, right? They don't have to go to the gym with you and hold your hand throughout this experience, but you have to, on your behalf, have to understand this is going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. It's not impossible by any stretch of the imagination. You're not dying. Um, this is your choice. And this is a privilege as, as Sue mentioned and understand this privilege comes with challenge and that your ability to experience this challenge is privilege, right? And take that challenge as a positive thing, not a negative thing. And I think that's important. And then communicate, point here is communicate all those challenges, maybe frustrations, uh, maybe uh, where you're falling short with people in your circle, whether that's your coach, your, uh, your spouse, your partner, whatever that is, your friends um, who are supporting you in this. And But all in all, sacrifice is gonna have to be made. Um, remember you, there are parts of having your cake and eating it too, but understand that you, you maybe just a piece or a couple slices, right? Not, not just the whole freaking cake here. Um, so there's things that have to be sacrificed and then communicating, um, with those around you and understand that, um, they don't know what they don't know. And unless you communicate that they're going to, it's going to be a hard road. Um, and, and you need to have your ducks in a row, uh, control the controllable. And that's one thing that you can, you can definitely control throughout the process. That's all I have. <laughs> all right. Um, anything else to add there? I think we touched on that pretty heavily. No, I think we touched on everything. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, topic number two, uh, Sue, finding your way in the online space is quite a challenging endeavor altogether something that we've all had to definitely deal with and handle and uh, at times have thrived and at times have, have absolutely struggled through. Um, and it's, it is an ebb and flow. And so the question here is how do you avoid getting quote unquote lost in the online space? Yeah. So with this one, it's kind of looking at how to separate yourself in a saturated market. Uh, 
when it comes to starting an online business, when it comes to being a fitness coach, the thing that I hear time and time again is uh, it's such a saturated market. Um, and to a good marketer, there's no such thing as too saturated. I will make that one point. Uh, but something within fitness, I challenge you to go on a walk outside to think about when you're at the grocery store next or when you're out in public, if you are allowed to go out in public right now, um, there's very obviously still a lot of people to help. So it is not oversaturated to the point that no one else needs help getting fit. It is something that the five most leading causes of death all have a diet or fitness um, or health, a movement like factor to them that could make it better. And so realizing that there is a lot of work to still be done. And when it comes to feeling like it's oversaturated, that might just be from your viewpoint of like following a lot of fitness accounts or following a lot of online coaches. And I've fallen into this myself of my social media. I follow a lot of coaches and brands and people that are talking about fitness all of the time. And so to me, I can open up my social media and be like, oh my gosh, people talked about this. I'm so tired of hearing of this. This is so oversaturated. But to the general public, recognizing that it really is not overly saturated. I mean, something that's very easy to bring me back around to realize that there's not as much information um, readily available to people is having conversations over the holidays about food and just the the major misconceptions. And it's like, oh, this is still very valid. People don't understand this. This is something that you can help people with. Uh, so first recognizing that it's really not that saturated. Uh, there's a lot going on there. Um, and it's something that even if it is saturated, being in a saturated market forces you to continually grow and innovate. So instead of looking at it as a negative, as ugh, this stinks, there's so many people doing this, look at it as, man, how can I keep getting better at this? And that might seem like, well, that's much easier said than done. Well, most things that are worth doing in life are much easier said than done. So recognizing that, yes, it is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult, but you want to be able to choose your hard. So would you rather be in a job that you're unhappy with living with every day or having a hard time of choosing a different hard of trying to break through in a saturated market? So kind of figuring out what that looks like for you. But some tips I'll kind of dive into. One is going to be finding your niche. Now this is pronounced niche or niche. I looked it up because I've always pronounced it niche. And then I hear a lot of people say niche. And I was like, before I go on this podcast and just completely embarrass myself, but apparently either pronunciation is correct. I will say niche because that is what I have always said. But finding what your niche is and finding what your target audience is is going to be absolutely huge for you. If you're an online coach listening to this, or honestly, if you're in any kind of field listening to this, a lot of these tips are going to translate over. Um, but finding what your niche is, uh, finding what your target audience is and how to find your target audience is who the frick do you want to work with or who do you want to buy your product? So um, being able to find what that is for you and and then also even being able to find a sub niche that's going to be a little bit less saturated. So while uh, some of you guys listening to this might be all fitness coaches, maybe one of your guys' sub niches is postpartum. Maybe another one is busy moms working. Maybe another one is college students. Maybe another one is elderly. Like there's all these special populations that you can kind of find that sub niche into and be able to provide value to. And that might have a little bit less saturation and you might be able to further niche yourself and be able to help those people. Um, another thing is being able to pay attention to your brand story of what you want that story to present um, and what you want people to recognize you guys for. When it comes to physique development, I think it is extremely evident that we are science-based and we are an educational-based coaching service. That is something that is what we preach. That's the clientele we want is people that want to learn, people that want to know about the science that don't just want to blindly follow directions. And so being able to understand what your brand story is and what you want that to project to other people. Um, another and one of the most important things is just to add value. You want to get to the point where you're adding so much value that people ask you if they can pay for it. So for example, I recently did a consult with someone. Um, so each of us have consults that we can do like, hourly consults if someone doesn't want to sign up for coaching. And I provided a ton of information on that consult call. And this is somebody who wants to do coaching in the future with us, but it just wasn't in the cards right now. And she 
I had already paid, had already gotten everything from me. And then she said, can I pay you more? You've provided me with so much. And it's to the point of how much information you provide for free. So all of our videos are for free and they're on YouTube. Um, all of our, this podcast is for free and you're able to consume this content. And this is something that you might be listening and be like, oh my gosh, they're giving away so much information for free. I wonder how much information they give away if they're going to charge for it. And that's extremely exciting. Once you recognize someone's not scarce within like, well, I'm going to nickel and dime someone for this information I just gave them. That's going to be huge for you because people are just going to look to you. Even if they have never had an experience with you, they're going to, in their mind, recognize that you know what you're talking about and you're giving away a lot of information. And if someone asks them like, oh, I'm looking for a coach or I'm looking for a product or whatever it may be, oh my gosh, look for physique development. They're always putting out so much information, even if they had never even worked with us before because they've benefited from what we've been able to project. So being able to make sure that you're adding value and you're giving that away um, and being able to provide that time and time again it's something that people are always going to consume and you always want to be able to have that value there. So you kind of want to do a mixture of being human and being a friend, but also being able to provide that value, being able to provide that education. Because if someone's just talking about their life, um, yes, a lot of people do follow along. I mean, think about celebrities, think about different vlogs that people do. Sometimes people just like to follow along other people's lives. But oftentimes the people's lives you truly follow along with are people that add value to you. Um, another thing is to pick one or two things to do well. So don't try to do everything. It was even something where people had recommended to us like, hey, why don't you put this on your site? Or why don't you um, have a product for this? And it's like, that's not our target audience. That's not the thing, the one or two thing that we want to do really well. We want to do training really well. We don't maybe want to dibble dabble around with other things that we could maybe make money on, or maybe we could grab some people in, but that's not what we truly are the best at. So being able to focus on one or two things to do well. Um, and then one of the best sales tactics I've ever heard and ever implemented and reaped the benefits from is to care. Um, when it comes down to it, especially within fitness coaching, somebody wants someone who cares, wants someone who's human, who shows up and is going to care about what's happening. So caring, caring about um, what that that person is more so than making the sale sometimes. It's something that time and time again, I've heard from clients, like you care so much, like it makes me either just wanna pay you more or just wanna give more to you for everything you've given to me. So do never underestimate how much it means to someone to care. Um, and I talked about being human, but being human is a big part of this. People don't buy coaching, they buy coaches. Um, because someone could talk about a coaching service time and time again, if I don't feel a connection Connection with that person, then it's going to be a very hard sale for me. But people buy coaches. So being able to show up online as yourself, find those quirks of you, find that niche, find what that makes you you. It's even something of like, uh, I know I quote the office a ton and a lot of people who follow me feel like more in tune with me because they love the office as well. And that might seem like something so silly, but because I've shared that piece of my life or shared my dogs or shared parts of my marriage or shared my competing, people feel connected to me and they feel this allegiance to me. Um, they feel like they want to work with me when it comes time that they're going to want to work with someone or to recommend me to someone who wants to work with them. So being able to focus on the authentic side, um, that's how you're going to build trust, um, showing your passions, being able to converse with the people in your space and ask questions instead of just making it a one-way street of I'm going to talk at you because people do want to feel connected to other people. Um, so being able to show yourself and talk to real people. So talking to real people, not only on your social media, but for us, all of us get on inquiry calls with people. So whenever a potential client wants to sign up, we get on a call. And that's something where we have talked, okay, this is sometimes feels like it's taking up a lot of time or is there a way that we could automate this to make it a little bit better? But at the end of the day, 
people want to talk to a real person. No one likes when you call someone and then it's the freaking automated service. And you're like, I just want to talk to a real person to get this problem resolved. And it's something that shows others that you're here to show up for them to give them some of your time for free um, to be able to provide that service for them in the long run. So it goes a very long way to be able to talk to an actual human and make that connection there. Um, Another few things here as I wrap up is being able to write, um, position yourself as an expert, um, being able to document your journey, which I've already kind of talked about. Um, And then it's also something that you want to think about as you're talking on your social media. Um, to speak to your peers and um, to speak to who you want to impact instead of just your peers. I know I get caught up in this of like, well, I want my peers to think that I'm smart or to I I learned this really cool thing and I want to put it out there. But at the end of the day, maybe your target audience doesn't give a flying who what that thing is. And you might be speaking over some people's heads while you're saying that and losing out on potential clients because now they've viewed you as a place that you can't come to their level. And so being able to show up in a way that you're talking and you're impacting the actual people that you want to impact instead of just talking to pad your ego. So making sure that you are talking to your target audience, you are talking to people that you want to impact and talking in that way. Um, So not writing for your ego. And then also realizing that um, likes don't matter when it comes to social media and a large social media following doesn't even matter. You want to think about what's going to convert. Let's say you have 100 followers and you might think I can't really build anything off of 100 followers. If you can monetize all 100 of those followers, then you're in a really solid place, much more above Becky, who has 100,000 followers, but can only monetize 25 of them. So being able to monetize and convert those people. So it's not just about likes, it's about website clicks, it's about swipe ups. um, It's about who's going to actually engage within your content and being able to put that out. Um, And then the last two things is to invest in yourself and surround yourself with people um, that are going to help you. So having a mentor in some way, you don't have to go out and buy fancy mastermind right when you first start coaching because you feel like that's the only way to make progress. Having someone that can mentor you that you truly feel like has your best interest in mind and you can bounce questions off of them and talk through things with them is going to be extremely beneficial for you, but also investing in yourself. When it comes to coaching in general, someone's investing in themselves for signing up for coaching and making that financial investment. And making financial investments is a great way to put your feet to the fire to actually show up for yourself. If I'm going to pay uh, 5000 10000 30000 or or $100, whatever it may be, for something, I'm going to pay attention to that. And so recognizing like where your, like, um, I think it's Tony Robbins who says this, like where your focus goes, your energy flows, but it's also where your money goes is a big part of that. Because when you're thinking about that investment, there's been studies showed that um, winning money isn't as alluring as someone or isn't as motivating as someone taking money away. Um, so the the case was, I think it was with um, smoking. This is a research study that I heard about a long time ago, so I might be misquoting some things here. Uh, but basically, it was either they were going to put money in your bank account if you were able to stop smoking for X amount of time, or at the end of the time frame, if you hadn't stopped smoking, they were going to take money away from your bank account. And the people who were um, offered money at the end were much likely to fall out because they weren't losing anything. They didn't have that money to begin with, and that money wasn't going to be coming to them. So it was kind of like net sum, I don't really care. But the people who are going to be losing money um, and money taken away were much more motivated to make it happen. So when it comes to coaching, it's something that when you price out your coaching, when you're going through that, um, it's something that you want to make sure that you're putting it in a place that is going to have focus towards you, um, that someone is actually going to care about it because it is an investment they're making in themselves. So biggest thing here is to care, to show up as yourself, to be human, and to not think that it's so saturated that you can't make a difference. Because I guarantee there's people that need you personally. They don't need you mimicking someone else. They need you being you and showing up as you. Because like I said, people do not buy coaching. They buy coaches. Well said. Very well said, Sue. And uh, some things I just want to echo in what you said and and maybe add a few things. one thing that you brought up was what I kind of think about is um, proximity echo or echo chambers. And this is something that we all 
absolutely experience on a daily basis. This is something that we absolutely experience from a political standpoint, um, from a cultural standpoint, uh, especially through social media channels. And that's getting into these echo chambers and you thinking that, oh, this is what everyone thinks, right? Because this is, I follow these people. This is what everyone's doing. This is what everyone thinks. And one of the the best ways I've explain this to folks and, and heard it explained is go outside and talk to the first 100 people around you. There's a high, very high probability. None of those people will be an online fitness coach, like probably like a 99% chance that it, it, obviously unless you're at a gym or something or like, you know, at a co-working space, but walk outside your house, talk to the first 100 people you see. Um, there's, there's a high probability that, um, there's honestly a high probability they've never heard of online coaching and didn't know it could be delivered online. I, I still talk to people uh, on a weekly basis that, um, you know, they go to the, my gym or whatever and they're, they ask me what I do. And I'm like, oh, I, I an online personal trainer. And they're like, oh, you can do that online. I didn't, I've never heard of that. And like, they're affluent people. They're, they're with it. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a market that to us in our echo chambers, it does seem saturated. And there are, there are a lot of us, um, but understand that again, people are hiring coaches, uh, not coaching as a whole and, um, understand that, that you're in an echo chamber of some kind. And, um, this is like the same thing of, of viewing your physique, I, I think is, uh, remembering that, you know, who you see online is not the, that's not the status quo. That's not the that's not everything that that's happening into the world. That's not a good explanation of, of or a good example of what's happening in the world, right? So, um, going to uh, going to your, let's say your community pool or the beach, right? Like in your social media feed, you make you may rank one hundred out of one hundred, at in terms of physiques on your social media feed, you may be in dead last, but you could still have a phenomenal physique, right? It, it's it's that proximity echo it's who you're following it's that echo chamber you're in and if you go to the let's say you go to your pool or you go to the beach you're going to realize quickly that you have a pretty you're well put together like you're healthy you look great and you're well above the the status quo of what you consider yourself to be when in perspective of your social media feed versus that perspective of in normal life. And I think that's an important distinction. That's something you have to keep in perspective. Um, and absolutely as someone who's maybe looking to get into or, or expand their themselves within the online space is you have to keep in perspective the best you can that you're in an echo chamber. And unless you get out of it, you're not going to be able to gain that perspective. And, and unless you're listening to this and hopefully you can draw, take yourself out. Um, so outside of that, I think hiring a coach that you respect uh, to teach you the ropes is a great uh, is a great way to learn. Um, this is something that we've all done to some degree. Uh, and it, I mean, I remember the first coach that I hired absolutely taught me how I was going to do things. Um, over the the kind of the first the, the the genesis of of coaching um how he handled his clients how he uh maybe how he didn't handle his clients so i'm, I'm learning things about that coach i'm learning thing about learning things about the process i'm learning how they program i'm learning how they deliver stuff uh, i'm learning so much right so if you have coaches that you respect um, this is something that we do a lot of um very fortunately that that people do respect us as a a coaching service and, and us as coaches that they want to hire us to sort of lead by example and show them the ropes early on um, and give them a good example of what this could be and what this can look like. And then you can just, again, you just kind of run from it, run with it from there, right? You're, you're constantly adapting. You're constantly learning. Um, you're able to ask that coach a lot of different questions and, and, and just see how they interact um, with their clientele when things come up or or whatever, right? And you're going to be able to see, oh, I really like how he does this, or I really like how she does this, but maybe I'll do this a little differently, or, or maybe I'll do this a little differently, or, or whatever else. So um, yeah, hiring a coach that you respect to teach you the ropes uh, is a great way to learn. Um, 
And I want to echo what Sue said here, and you're not speaking to your peers or other coaches, you're speaking to people that you want to help and want to work with. And this is something that I definitely had to um, remember throughout my, I've had to remember throughout my career as um, I found myself around uh, just different people throughout my career. And those who I felt pressured around to almost you know, speak above the level I needed or I desired to speak at to prove myself in some way, which is just asinine. It doesn't make sense. Um, and I, I'm not putting out content to show my intelligence. I'm not putting out content uh, to to prove anything. I, I want to put out content to genuinely help those who who need help, right? And that's getting a feel. It's getting a vibe of of what people in your immediate circles and people within your social circles are are getting um getting hung up on or, or sort of lost within so um Sue, <laughs> sue's chair is uh having a heart attack here um so <laughs> i think that's that's a really important thing to keep in mind as well right so understand that your intent is different than the way like your execution right so um, the content you're putting out versus the content that or the you, the content you know that is going to answer people's questions thoroughly that that are following you is completely different, right? So if I know I have a fairly entry level uh, base of clients or, or base of people that follow me, and I'm speaking about high level fitness stuff that other coaches may sort of be like, "Hey, man, that's super cool," or "Oh my god, yeah, I, I you know I learned this last week." you're not trying to teach other coaches here. And and I I say this very bluntly to, to other coaches that I'll speak to, um, whether it's on a podcast or just a personal conversation. You're not going to teach me anything. Like, you're, like, if you're listening to this, and that's not to say like you're never going to teach me anything, but there's a high probability that I'm not going to learn something new from you and I shouldn't be learning something new from you because unless I'm your target client, you need to change your your approach, right? You need to speak, not talk down. You need to speak to those who are needing you and you need, you need to speak to those who are following you, right? And that's, again, to echo what Sue said, uh, you're not speaking to your peers or other coaches. You're not trying to impress. You're not trying to show your intelligence. Um, you're trying to help those who need help and remember that that's how you're going to get clients, um, not just boost your ego or impress your friends or or whatever and honestly they could care less probably what you're putting out so help yourself here and, and don't waste the time um the last our last thing i really want to really want to point out is something i think we do really well um and that's from the jump we've always had the the motive of being referral based um over anything right so we're always trying to how can we deliver value in a way where I'm not necessarily looking for you to, you know, re-sign with me or or to sign back up after a six month plan unless you really want to? All I'm looking for is a great experience. I want to get you to a a goal that you desire. I want to help you along the way. I want to educate you. And my hope isn't for you to come back or pay me again. My hope is that you tell a friend or two about your experience, um, or if it comes up in casual conversation, you speak highly of us. Right. And, and you do that at scale. And that really does help grow a business. And this is something that I've seen with all of us. And I've, I've seen it with us as a company is once you can get into, you're not always fighting tooth and nail to introduce yourself to new people, doing cold calls, doing, doing all of these things where people you're having to teach people about you for the first time. And they're just, they're just hearing about you from yourself for the first time. The more you can get folks who are, hey, I, I came from this client. Hey, this person speaks really highly of you. Hey, I started following you because of this person, and I've been following you for a while. And and they they say they had a great experience with you. And you know, I'm just ready to go. I'm I'm lost in X, Y, and Z. And I just really I really want someone who who knows. And I I just you know I, I've heard nothing but great things about you, uh, or you guys. And again, like being referral based and having the intent of of staying or becoming referral based instead of sales-based, I think is, if you're looking for a one-on-one -on -one coaching 
approach, I think that is is such a crucial way to uh, to think about it and, and to sort of plan around or, or kind of have your intent be. Um, so I'll hand it off to Alex here because uh, I know he's he's got some great ones to to deliver here. Yeah, I've I've got uh, three quick points uh, that I'll I'll echo off of both of you as everything was was really well touched on. The first thing being the the saturation. Looking at looking at the the saturation of the market or, or whom you follow more so as a networking opportunity and those who you can build relationships with, um, you can provide value to as well, uh, create friendships, all these different things. It's it's a much better way of looking at things of like how can I uplift that person? How can that person uplift me? All those different things to better look at it rather than being like, damn, uh, you know, Joe posted this today. I guess I'm not going to post about that. Like, how can I bring in maybe his post to also be helpful into what I want to talk on or, or different things like that is going to be beneficial. Uh, the, the care portion of things, uh, we are, Austin had talked on just how fortunate we are for younger coaches or newer coaches to reach out to us on a very regular basis. And many times it's like, I have 10 clients. I just want to, I want to have more. I want to have more. And and the reality is, and and for us over the past six years, it's been, how can we make a better experience for those 10 clients? How can we have them, you know, shouting from the rooftops that, that we are the best coaching service that there possibly is. And that's how we've been able to grow over that time frame of that approach rather than being like, okay, I have these 10, but like, you know, it's just 10. Like, how can I get to 20? How can I get to 30? It's more of like, how can we make the best experience possible for those 10 to get, you know, to have more clients in the future. And then with Sue talking on the following not being something that is important. Um, I, I encourage everyone to kind of think of each time you make a post, think as though you're you're holding a party at your house with all the followers that you have. If you have a hundred followers, think of all those hundred people packing into your apartment or packing into your house. It would be insane. And you would feel you know, so uplifted of like all these people are paying attention to what I'm about to say. And that is is a, a great feeling of, okay, now I can really impact these people. How can I better benefit them? How can they walk away from this post and feel better and, and enriched in their own life and, and apply this within their day-to-day uh, tasks? So I think that those are important pieces as well, uh, which leads us into our third question of, of today's podcast. Austin. We talk a lot about exercise execution and technique being a very valuable skill for uh, anyone who is training. How does one focus on form when starting out on their fitness journey or starting out their resistance training career? Yeah, thanks, Alex. And I think the the most important thing to keep in mind here um, is that you're not aiming for perfection. You're shooting for progress or you're aiming for progress or progression. Um, so we've spoken on this and and paralysis by analysis is one of the um one, one of the biggest roadblocks in this uh in this progression and in this sort of journey if you will of, of in having good form uh lifting with good form uh having good exercise technique however you want to put it um understanding that you're not going to be perfect when you start. This is with any skill, right? You, you've, I doubt you've ever picked up if you're, you know, played sports growing up. If you picked up, you know, the, the main object of that sport. Let's say it's basketball. You picked up a basketball for the first time, and you're like, oh my god, I'm just draining threes. I got a stick crossover. Um, you know, that, not, none of that's true, right? You've had to work at it. You've had to do the fundamentals. You've had to do the simple drills over and over and over again, right? And you know, uh, something that always comes into mind is like how many, uh, how many at bats you may have throughout your, your baseball career or something. Um, and and Alex is a, is a great example of, um, someone who just had thousands and thousands and thousands of hits, right. And whether that's off a tee, whether that's from a pitching machine, whether that's from a live, uh, live pitcher or whatever it is, it's, it's one of those things where you're just doing the fundamentals. Um, you know, I, I've been to, uh, like countless, uh, throughout my th- throughout my sporting career, uh, sh- shooting camps, for example, from basketball, and it was days on days on days of the meticulous detail of just catching a ball and like setting up for a shot, and never shooting. Right, just hours and hours of different situational uh, things of how you would maneuver, how would you set this up, um, and I, I speak on these things because 
it's so important to understand that I'm not sure where the disconnect is. Um, you know, for something that can be so beneficial for your life over a lifespan, um, something that brings so much to you men mentally, physically, and emotionally, um, such as strength training, that we're not willing to invest into the fundamentals like we are in other sports, right? Exercise technique and exercise execution to me is the tried and true fundamentals. It's learning how to dribble. It's learning how to field a grounder. It's learning how to how to do a set if you're if you're a volleyball player. It's it's learning the absolute fundamentals of the sport, right? Learning how to catch if you're going to be a wide receiver in football. Like learning how to kick a damn soccer ball if you're going to play that sort of football, right? It's like learning how to dribble in in, in soccer as well or football. So it's like these are fundamentals that in no other uh, in no other sport are we, are we questioning like the importance of, of putting in the time or putting in the work or putting those foundational weeks, months, or years in. And for some reason, we, whether it's our ego or, or just this assumption of, oh, it's just such a natural thing to go into a gym and lift up weights, which it's really not. Um, <laughs> we, we just get lost in that the fact that we should just know how to do this or, as soon as you pick up a weight, you're going to do it right. Um, and so understanding that that you have to invest in these fundamentals, right? So I want to kind of start this conversation off with looking at exercise technique as a, fun to, as a fundamental within the sport that this is, within the activity that this is, right? You have to learn how to run, right? right? You don't just start out a, a you know, an Olympic, you don't have Olympic-based form, right, in, in running. You have, to, you have to invest into that right? You don't start out just being good at something. You have to invest into the fundamentals of that, that thing, that activity, right? So that's what this is. Okay. So the goal, um, another point is the goal is not to cripple yourself into overthinking it. This is in the kind of in the same camp as paralysis by analysis, right? Don't overthink it. Don't cripple yourself by overthinking it. It's like any skill, the details matter. And so does the big picture, right? So understanding that, you know, going back to like a basketball example, Understanding how generally to get the ball in the basket is still an important thing to keep in mind, right? The little details of how to catch a pass and or receive like a bounce pass and catch it, get into a shooting position, you know, all the fine details of a shooting motion, for example, it's really important for you to also keep in mind how to get that ball into the basket. Um, and there are a lot of things, right, between the bigger picture of something and the fine nitty gritty details. Right. So don't lose sight of the bigger picture for this example of like a movement pattern and all the tiny details that may go into that, whether it's, it's with the setup or it's with the, the internal cues or some external cues you might hear or whatever. Right. So don't lose sight of the bigger picture here and understand that this is going to be a progression from set to set to session to session, from phase to phase, from years of training to years of training. Right. I, I, I talk about this a lot where I, you know, I know, I know early on, like, um, you know, when I can only speak to, to like when Alex and I used to train, um, together when we were first getting started was, you know, we kind of, I wouldn't say we were ever really like crazy off with our execution, but there was definitely like, if we were going to grade it today, it would be like six seven out of ten like <laughs> mm, you could improve uh that could have got better uh you're lifting with ego there um that's completely wrong um you know you're not even set up properly to hit that muscle here um and we just over the course of years and years started to one start to pay attention to it understanding that these were fundamentals of this activity the fundamentals of the sport right so going back to do I want to be really good at this? Do I want to compete in some way? Do I want to be a power lifter, um, some sort of Olympic lifter or um, a, a bodybuilder, right? And so in the, in the course of like staying on topic of this podcast, to be a really good physique athlete, it does you a ton to be really good at exercise technique, have really good exercise execution. It does you good to be able to really control where tension is going and to create a really good stimulus within your workouts to stimulate all the things that come with building muscle, losing body fat, um, 
and all the things that come with the, the just the health related benefits of strength training, right? So again, don't get too hung up in every single detail from the jump. Understand, keep in mind of the bigger picture um, and understand that this is an investment period for the rest of your lifting career, right? It, it In a sense, it is like riding a bike, right? So you had to learn how to ride the bike, but now every time you go and let's say you haven't ridden a bike for a few years, the first time you ride that bike, the f- first couple times you ride that bike, it's going to be like a s- kind of an awkward experience, but you're not going to forget how it was done, right? I doubt you fall, you know, I doubt that you're wobbling and like completely, um, out of coordination of riding a bike, but it's going to feel weird. You may not, you know, lean or, or turn into a certain way or, or pedal properly, um, or exactly how you should or how you used to, but you're going to get the general sense. You're going to remember that neurologically. You're going to remember that, um, from a movement pattern perspective, right? And that's the same with, that's the same with strength training. So you have to invest, invest into learning how to ride the bike. So every time you see a bike, you can hop on it and go, right? So now every time I could take, I I could take months and months or years off of the gym. And I'm very, very confident with all the time that I've put into training my nervous system, all the time I've put into, to learning these fundamentals, I would be able to go into that situation and be very confident and competent in that skill, in that fundamental, right? And there'd be a lot of work to do. There'd be some reprogramming to do definitely. And it may feel awkward at first, but understand that that investment period is an investment period in the le- in the rest of your lifting career, right? So every structure needs a solid foundation and that's what you're doing. You're building a really, really solid foundation to build. Just thinking about lifting across a lifespan, you're kind of just assembling a skyscraper over your life. And that's like, that's how I conceptualize it in my mind, right? If my goal is to build a skyscraper and I'm looking to get to the hundredth floor, let's say every year is a, a, a floor, right? So right now I'm at, I'm fresh at 27 floors. I'm really, really banking on that foundation holding and, and being well set up to, to manage this construction and this, this activity across a lifespan, right? And so the goal here is to improve your ability to create tension and target muscle tissues, the ability to better control loads as the intensity increases or fatigue sets in, right? Those are, those are big things to improve the safety of each exercise and to limit injury long-term. Again, those are huge things. So if we look at the overall benefit of strength training or the benefits that come from strength training, those are, those are a part of what we're doing only if we're doing the activity, right? So if I start reaping the rewards of strength training or, or resistance training over the first 12 to 18 months of my life, me starting that activity and then I get injured and then I get injured again and then I get injured again. And then I, you know, over the course of years and years and years, or even over a course of months and months and months, I'm going to lose what I gained over that first 12 to 18 months. Right. So the, the vast and crucial benefits that come from this activity are predicated on us constantly and consistently performing this activity across our lifespan, right? So I think it's a very important investment period to learn how to save your joints, learn how to uh, properly uh, execute lifts, how to dictate where tension is going um, and feel very confident when you go into the gym and again, limit injury long-term um, and improve the overall safety of, of exercises and, and, and exercising altogether, right? So there's a few things that I just want to uh, touch on here and just mention. Um, so if you're someone who's just starting out or someone who's very interested in improving exercise technique, um, this is something we help our clients with uh, a lot. And there are some who come in who are already fantastic and we don't have much to change. There just may be some setup things that we have to change. And some come in and we have to sort of start from from ground zero, which is perfectly fine. Um, and as long as you're being, as long as you're teachable, be coachable, um, and understand that with anything you go into, right? Like if you joined a basketball league and 
you haven't played basketball in a while, you may go in and have to relearn some of the fundamentals and that's okay. It doesn't make you a, a terrible person or it doesn't make you not worthy of doing the activity. It just means you have to sort of take a step back and, and invest into some fundamentals again. Okay. So a few things I want to kind of touch on here, um, things to keep in mind and things that can help when starting out um, and wanting to focus on form or, or exercise technique. Uh, number one is slowing things down and lowering your loads. Okay. So as we discussed in episode three, tempo matters and should be used as a tool to regain control of loads we are lifting. All right. So this is something that is probably one of the hardest things to do for a lot of people is to lower the loads and slow, slow down the tempo of the loads they're lifting, right? So if you're training like an Olympic athlete, um, it's going to be hard to learn the fundamentals. This is the same thing as like every time you go into the gym, you only shoot half court shots or three pointers, right? You're probably not going to get very good at the sport of basketball. If you're every time you go in, you're only shooting three pointers and half court shots, right? If you're not investing into that time of getting good at dribbling, shooting free throws, all the great fundamentals of, of basketball, for example, you're not going to be very good. So if you want to be good at form, if you want to be good at exercise technique, slow things down, accept that loads are going to go down temporarily and understand that you're building a foundation, right? You're building those first blocks in your foundation or you're maybe repairing some blocks that have that have washed out over years of of questionable form right so again i'll i'll absolutely admit to years of questionable form of a shoddy foundation that i was that i was building upon doesn't mean you're not progressing um but it means that progression long term across your lifespan is going to be compromised to some degree and there's going to be plateaus that you hit that you could have maybe avoided um, the injuries that you could have avoided, right? So again, think, think of this as an investment period, um, slowing things down and lowering your loads will, will definitely, uh, improve and it'll help you improve, uh, over a shorter time span, right? So I think being in the headspace of, all right, this is an investment period. I'm taking the next three months, six months, and I just want to focus on this, right? You're, if you do that and you understand that you're doing that and you're intentional with that, those things will improve uh, much quicker than you think. And the you having to slow things down as much is going to change, right? You having to lower your loads is going to change, right? You're going to get you end up getting much stronger over time uh, by doing this. Number two is going to be filming yourself and looking over sets or sending it to a coach for review. Okay, so it's often to find. Um, it's common to find something small in our setup or tweak in execution. Um, small variances in setup can make a big difference when it comes to technique. Okay, this is something that you'll see in all of our videos. Okay, so if you're if you're not set up properly from the beginning, you're going to be finding yourself throughout each rep and set to try and correct it, and it's going to feel like garbage to be honest with you. Um, and so if you have those exercises that you you know you know you know they train the lats, like you know this is supposed to be training the lats. And you know it's, it's supposed to feel, it, when I when I watch this person do it, it just always looks smoother. I know it's supposed to feel smoother. I just feel like I'm biting myself the whole rep, right? These are these are things that we do for clients. This is, you know, if they'll film an exercise, they'll send it over. Um, we'll take a look at their, the, the first thing that's always going to stand out is how are you set up, right? And it's hard to know how you're personally set up unless you film it, right? So even if you're just evaluating your own execution, film the set, right? So Alex posted the other day on his story about uh, his tempo within the leg press, right? It felt much, the pause at the bottom felt much longer than it truly was, right? So there are things that you find out, even someone has, as seasoned as Alex um, in, in execution, you're, you're always gonna find yourself or catch yourself doing something if you're able to go back and review it and watch it, right? So this extends to us even this extends to people that that we know even that are sort of masters within this um down to the to the person who's just starting out right no one's perfect and we're not trying to be perfect we're just trying to progress and be better than we were the session before right so filming yourself and looking over sets or seeing it to a coach for review 
is a phenomenal way to get better at exercise execution. Um, number three, uh, which kind of builds upon filming yourself uh, in, a in a sort of way, um, understanding the basic anatomy and functions of the muscles being used for each exercise. I, I think this really, really helps people out um, to understand um, what the exercise is, what muscle or muscles does this train, uh, where are those muscles and where do they originate and insert? What is the main function I'm looking to perform with these muscles, right? So this isn't, a, this isn't something that you have to be an expert in anatomy or understand how applied um, biomechanics or, or anatomy function or works. It's just understanding the basics. It's understanding that, you know, instead of thinking about a bench press, like, oh, a bit, we train bench on chest day. Okay, well, if we're looking to train the chest, there's a multitude of exercises we could use. And if I understood the muscles being trained and kind of where those muscles are and kind of how they sort of function, I'm going to be a lot better off when I go to perform the movement, right? I'm going to be able to connect with that muscle better. I'm going to be able to set myself up better, understand why I'm setting myself up like this. Um, and it's going to make a lot more sense, right? Uh, it's going to put that bigger picture together as the details really start to fill in the gaps, right? I'll think about sort of a, putting a puzzle together. It's kind of doing the edges first and then filling in the, the inside from there, right? So you're getting the general structure down and then we're filling it in. We're starting to see the picture more clearly over time as that puzzle gets put together, all right? So um, understanding the basic anatomy and functions of muscles being used for each exercise, okay? So that is going to really, really help. And that's something that we educate our clients on. Um, and that's where a, a lot, a lot, a lot of those videos on YouTube that are free, where you can go look them up right now and take a look at what I'm talking about. So we always talk about the setup and we talk about the anatomy used. That's the first thing we always talk about, right? And that's why we talk about those things is because you, one, you have to, it helps to understand what anatomy is being used and the general purpose of that and then understanding how to properly set yourself up because it becomes a lot easier to perform these movements well once you understand those things and once you set yourself up properly to perform those things and the last thing i will touch on here uh, is patience know that your strength and loads will uh will return back and supersede eventually those pre-existing uh, strength levels, and you will create more you'll, your ability to create more efficient uh, coordination and contractions, and, and the overall experience of, of lifting will improve for you. I just I promise that it will. It, it will. You'll feel better. You'll perform better over time, um, and your strength will return and supersede as long as your programming isn't garbage. Uh, will supersede what they were right? And the biggest thing here is understanding that this takes patience. This is like anything. Um, again, to go back to the, the example of sports and fundamentals, you, you cannot expect yourself to pick up a new sport or to pick up something that you haven't done in a while. Um, if you never learn the fundamentals of that sport to be thrown in a, thrown in a game, you're going to quickly realize what those, those, those holes in your, your skills are. Um, and this is sort of kind of honestly goes back to uh, things that that really help out within a prep. If you're looking to start a prep, if you're looking to, to uh, compete, damn, this is going to help you out. Like this is going to help you out a ton if you're able to properly execute movements, really um, control where uh, tension is going. Um, it's going to help us be able to do less overall volume and save yourself from injury, um, less accumulation of overall stress, which is going to help your fat loss journey, which is going to help your everything. Right. And so this really goes into your ability, um, just to be really good at this and, and to feel good while you're doing it. Right. So, uh, that, that's my, that's my ending. Uh, those are things to keep in mind. So fairly long winded, which is pretty common for me, but, um, 
if you can just go back and, and re-listen to some of those points um, and, and understand that this is a fundamental that I, I think is crucial that I don't think should be overlooked. And I know there's some different views out there about it, but if you really think about it logically, improving the fundamental of something that you do day in and day out cannot be a negative thing, right? Especially if it helps you get better at that, become stronger, get better results, avoid injury, all of these things, right? So understand that this fundamental, I think, is is absolutely valuable. It's something we work with our clients extensively on, and we see better results because of it. Yeah, I mean, you absolutely killed it there. And I hope I'm not the only one listening who each time you said fundamental, this probably was because we just watched this episode, the mafia office episode where he has fundamental and he's like, it's going to be <laughs> mental how much fun this yeah. is. And then he says, I'll write a book on business. <laughs> and it's somehow I manage the fundamentals of business. But just watch that episode. So had to had to make a note there. Um, but the things I'll mention here is that execution does take time even once you know how to do it. So once you watch a video, you have the tips, you understand them, it still takes time to put into practice. I can watch dance videos and makeup videos and really any videos on skills that I do not have and be like, oh yeah, that's not, that seems simple enough. I know how to do it but I'm not actually doing it well until I've put practice into it. As Austin um, talked about just what a big fundamental that is. And so it's going to take time once you know how to do it to be able to optimize it um, and to have that mind muscle connection. So all of clients and videos, I'm like, the execution is there. We are just going to have to do this time and time again to get it perfect. And they're like, well, I don't understand what else do I need to fix to have better mind muscle connection. And it's, it's, time. Time is what you need right now to be able to put it into practice and to be able to reap the benefits from it. And the other notion I'll make here is just that um, your training is there to prevent injury and to give you mobility and to help with longevity. Um, training is something that is often recommended by doctors to help within a lot of ailments that are going on. Exercise can help that. And so you want to make sure that the exercise that's supposed to be giving you mobility, that's supposed to be preventing injury, isn't causing immobility or injury by the way that you're doing it. And if you compound poor execution time and time again, you will have injuries, you will have strains, you will have some wonky parts of your body that just aren't working right. Um, so being able to know the execution, understand the anatomy like Austin talked about is going to be huge for your longevity um, as a lifter and just in your body in general. Yeah. Um, for me to add on to this, I think that uh, the, the number one thing is, uh, that I that I wrote from Austin is that um, social media is, is certainly opening us up to those one in a million individuals that, uh, you know, pick up these traits and are just incredible. And it's very easy to be like, damn, I'm not like that. So I'm just not going to get started. And prior to social media, it wasn't you were you were really in your own lane, especially as a kid or anything like that, where um all you knew was maybe your friends around you. And you may have had a friend who was immensely elite right when they started, but social media opens us up to the entire world. And it gives us uh, the the eyes of like, oh, wow, there's, there's a lot of people who are doing this right. And I feel lesser than because of that. And so uh, allowing yourself to, to really uh, step back and say, hey, this is one of billions of people. Um, I, I can still do this type thing. Uh, and then the other thing is just, you know, practice is, is going to be huge. There's never a time, and, and all three of us will uh, speak on this, is that our execution is in a very good spot. But there are certainly things that I'm still working on that Sue and, and Austin are still working on, um, even throughout you know many, many years of training and many, many hours devoted. Uh, an easy example to this is that I play Call of Duty very seldomly. Um, I would love to be an, an incredible Call of Duty player, player but I understand that it would you know, I'd have to make it a priority to be an incredible Call of Duty player. I'm not willing to do that. Thus, I suck. And <laughs> if you continue to deprioritize your execution and things of that nature, you're going to continue to suck. So let's stop sucking and put more time into the execution and, and, and be somebody who, um, you know, is, is excelling at the, the execution of things. 
Um, that was very interesting because when I hear you talk about Call of Duty, I just hear that you and Mark are phenomenal and you guys should I, go pro. Listen, so I, I've got to hype myself up so that I'm not just completely depressed with my gameplay. I know. He says all the time, he's like, man, if I could just go pro for Call of Duty, I would just have it made. Yeah. Um, so if you see him starting to fall off on social media, you know he has devoted his time elsewhere. Yeah, for you'll other be able to talents. find me on Twitch. I'll, I'll uh, let you guys know. <laughs> But even just what Alex said, as far as, um, yes, you see with social media, it does open the world up and you're seeing people that might be doing it well on that same vein. You might be seeing people that have phenomenal physiques that have awful form. And you might be like, well, what's the catch there? It's an elite physique that really any kind of movement would probably facilitate the same results. And that's something I got caught up into is watching people who have phenomenal ex- physiques and especially within competing a lot of the people that are the top of the top they like there's nothing specific they did to get them there they are just elite in general their bodies are phenomenal and great um but it's something where i'll be like well their form is so god awful how are they growing body parts how are they even like perpetuating that. Um, and that's going to be something that it's going to be a percent of people that are able to grow certain body parts, even if that's not doing it the perfect way there. So being able to kind of hold that in your mind as you're looking through stuff, scrolling through social media, um, and being able to take the facts with you and not taking the outliers and thinking that that's going to be you. Yeah. I I think that's incredibly valuable to keep in mind. And this is like one of the biggest things within like weak point training, which we'll touch on in a, in a future episode. But if you have a weak body part that you're wanting to bring up, one of the first things you should address is how well you can execute the movements that use that muscle group. Um, right. So, I mean, so many examples come to mind. Uh, but like, for example, like if you're, if you're training chess, for example, and you're, every chest movement, your, your triceps and your delts take over the entire movement. How do you expect your chest to grow extensively if you're not placing a lot of tension on it over and over and over again, right? And all that, most of that tension is being displaced fr- from your delts, from your triceps. Um, you know, you do that enough over time. Yeah, you're probably going to have some great triceps and delts and your chest is going to remain a weak area until you learn how to address um, address the issue. And it's sure more could be the answer, but if you're doing more of less optimal training or less, if you're doing more of doing what you suck at, again, your body can only handle so much. Um, and this is where you're going to run into overuse issues, pain in your elbows, pain in your shoulders, right? And this is what getting into improving your execution allows us to do overall, do, do more with less over time, which will index greatly for you uh, over time across your lifespan and to reap the benefits, not only in your physique, but in your health uh, and the longevity of what this could be for you. Um, and I know we, we speak on a lot of physique stuff, but it's important to remember that one of the, the greatest benefit um, to this is to, to remain healthy and to live a long and, and thriving, healthy life. And uh, we, that cannot be lost in in us talking about improving your physique or or whatever from an aesthetic standpoint right like it it does come down to living a a long and healthy life and doing that across a lifespan which is is incredibly important so keep those keep that stuff in mind um great episode today i i thought these were great topics and i was really excited to to dive into all of them so um see you guys in the next one stoked episode five you guys have anything to add no we're good (laughs) awesome see you guys in the next one